All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. Our speaker today is Dr. Paul Nickerson, Department of Surgery, Associ Assistant Professor of Surgery, VTCSOM. He's a graduate of the University of Alabama in 2010 and completed his general surgery and colorectal surgery fellowships at the Mayo Clinic in 2016. After taking his first position at the MD Anderson Cancer Center, he began to explore the benefits of cancer preventative measures. He moved to Virginia in 2019 and has participated in roundtables from the American Cancer Society in conjunction with the Virginia Department of Health on prevention and screening. He enjoys participation in resident and medical student education. His areas of interest are colorectal disease, and HPV epidemiology and its impact. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Nickerson. Good morning, Thank you. Is it okay if I unmask yeah. now? Yeah. I wore my dress mask for today. <laughs> so, um, disclosures. I have no financial disclosures, unfortunately. Uh, nobody pays me for this. Um, and uh, I guess the biggest thing, elephant in the room, is what am I doing here, talking at a pediatric conference about colorectal diseases? None of my patients are under the age of uh, 18. And I'm by no means an expert in vaccines or viruses. But I am very interested in preventative measures, especially in colorectal diseases. And some of the diseases we'll talk about can be particularly debilitating and could be completely preventable. So that's kind of where we're going to go with this talk today. Special thanks to my former partner, Craig Messick, uh, who got me started on this uh, project and gave me some of his data, some of his slides, which I will shamelessly reuse again here today. Objectives. We're going to talk a little bit about human papillomavirus, papillomavirus in general, and uh, specifically the characteristics and transmissibility of the oncogenic types. We're going to talk about anal dysplasia, which is one of the main things that I see in HPV-related um, diseases. Um, try to understand some of these management strategies, outcomes, anal cancer, progression from dysplasia to, to cancer, and also review colon and rectal cancer and how HPV may contribute to that as well. So we'll get started on some basics and kind of catch up on some, you know, research of the last 30 years or so here. So papillomaviruses have been around for a long time. You know, the triceratops probably had one. Um, they can be, uh, you know, estimated to be over 350 million years old. There's a lot of non-human strains that affect mammals as well as reptiles. There's about 200 human strains. 40 of those have a predilection for uh, the anal mucosa. And uh, we kind of break those human strains up into different genera based on their um, tissue tropism, whether they like cutaneous skin or mucosa. Alpha is the number one that we talk about. That's the highest risk of cancer. These are our oncogenic types, the big ones, 16 and 18. The others may cause warts or other growths, laryngeal papillomatosis, those sorts of things. Very low risk of cancer, but they can be um, a nuisance. What's so special about HPV? Well, it's very transmissible. Uh, it's a small, circular, double-stranded DNA virus, about 8,000 8, uh, base pair. It's uh, super coiled, and it likes epithelium. It's non-enveloped and has a capsid, which makes it very tenacious and very transmissible. Enveloped viruses tend to desiccate in the environment where capsid viruses tend to survive for long periods of time outside of the host. This particular um, virus codes for nine proteins, and, and it's very um, efficient at, um, at, at encoding for those things. And like most viruses, it hijacks the host mechanics to, rep to replicate itself. The main thing that we think about is the L1 gene, which codes for the major capsid protein. That's the one that gives us the different types, especially the oncogenic types that we're worried about. 16, 18, 31, 33, 35, et cetera. Um, others can code for, uh, you know, or tend to cause warts, uh, plantar warts, or condylomatous type warts, anal warts, genital warts. And the, the 
oncogenic potential all comes down to the to the l one gene, but also some of the early proteins that we'll go into a little bit here. So the genome itself, again, very efficient. It has the types of things that it can use to hijack the host cell. I'll use my mouse so that the online crew can see me here. But key in on E6 and E7. These are the transforming proteins. E6 especially is the most oncogenic potential of all the, um, of all the genes, all the proteins that the HPV genome can produce. It can actually bind to human P53, our universal tumor suppressor gene. That leads to unregulated cell growth. And the, uh, the retinoblastoma protein is one of our genes that helps us induce apoptosis if there's DNA damage. So by, um, by binding to those proteins and essentially disabling <coughs> the proteins of those gene products can lead to abnormal cellular replication and then, and then uh, to early cancer or dysplasia, precancerous lesions, and often to cancers. <clears throat> A little bit on the epidemiology of this. We're going to talk about some transmissions uh, transmission legends and myths. So we all know that you know Loch Ness monster isn't real. It was just you know fake. So he doesn't have HPV, but Sasquatch probably does. Um, some of the myths here are that you only get it from unprotected sex, and we're going to show how that's not true. Condoms may help transmission, but it certainly isn't a failsafe. Another myth is that it's only of concern in patients with HIV or AIDS. Although HIV does <clears throat> pretend, uh, those are the highest risk patients that will have HPV. Um, the ones also that have HIV or AIDS, they're at highest risk of malignant transformation. But we're going to talk a little bit about how anyone can, um, how anyone can still get cancer despite um, despite not being in that high risk group. Another one, you only get it if you have uh, anal receptive intercourse. Well, that's not true either. In fact. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about cross transmission from cervix, cervical specimens to anal specimens as well. Another myth, if there's no symptoms, you're not infected. Well, there rarely are symptoms from human papillomavirus. Um, very few people get symptoms such as a growth or a ward or something that would um, trigger them to, to be concerned. Um, another myth, we only worry about the high risk types, right? The, 16 and 18 and the oncogenic subtypes. While those certainly are the highest risk of progressing to cancer, they're not the only ones that can progress. And some of the low risk uh, subtypes may cause cancer in some patients. The myth of clearance or the discussion of clearance, it may be possible that humans can clear this virus, but what, what more likely happens is that there's an active infection for about a 12 month period, at which point the body is able to you know, clear the infection, but the virus often enters a latency period. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, um, about how it would do something like that. The greatest one here is not me, and we're going to go into this in detail. <clears throat> Ways to transmit the virus, one is direct transmission, which is contact. Um, HPV is the most common sexually transmitted infection worldwide, and it is most commonly transmitted sexually. But that is not the only way to transmit the HPV virus. This, was, this explains the direct contact. Unprotected sex leads to transmission of the virus. That is the majority of the way that it is transmitted. But likely everyone has been exposed at some point. Even people who are not yet sexually active can be exposed to the virus. Other methods, you guys may be more familiar with this, is vertical transmission. An infected mother gives birth to a child. And when we test the, ch the child for presence of HPV, it's often there. The first case of res respiratory papillomatosis was described in 1956. And this was from a, an infant that was born to a mother who had an active HPV infection. Some studies from Korea demonstrated that the transmission rate was about 20%. In Finland, um, again, about 22% uh, about of infants had um, HPV DNA. Sometimes it was found in the placenta or in the cord blood or in the breast milk. Another one out of Canada with a similar type results. 
the uh, the interesting thing is that these foreign studies were all done in women uh, who gave birth via C-section. So it makes sense that an infant passing through the cervix of an infected mother would be exposed to the virus. But how are they exposed if they're born through C-section? Well, the virus can cross the placenta, apparently. And it can actually infect an, an, an infant in utero. Another way to transmit the virus, and this is actually way more common than we thought, is indirect transmission. The virus can live in, on a fomite, on inanimate objects like a doorknob or a toilet flush handle, um, often through sloughed squamous cells. <clears throat> the body sheds squamous cells daily, and the virus can survive in capsid form in those sloughed squames. <clears throat> this was demonstrated, uh, whew, that's a long time ago, uh, over 20 years ago, 25 years ago, by the NCI, where I guess they were bored and they just got around and tested a bunch of HPV on a bunch of surfaces, treated it different ways, tested, looked at it on days uh, one, day three, and day seven after treatment to measure how much of the virus was still active at those times. At room temperature, sitting on the shelf, 30% of the virus was still active after seven days. If it was heated, it, it would, you know, heated to 65 degrees, that killed a significant amount of viruses. EDTA didn't kill anything. 70% ethanol, that's most of our hand sanitizers now, right? Nearly completely killed the virus. And autoclave, which is how we sterilize our surgical instruments, uh, was 100% effective. So in, you know, an open atmosphere, the half-life of the virus could be three days or more. So you can imagine that it's probably fairly prevalent. We look at cervical cancer incidents just to kind of, you know, get a big picture of HPV transmission. It's easier to measure than swabbing everybody on the planet for, um, for HPV. But you can see areas that are red or dark are bad, and areas that are yellow or green are a little bit better. But there's no country on the planet except for Greenland, I guess, that, that is not affected by um, human papillomavirus. And we, uh, we look at this because, you know, over 70 or 80 percent of cervical cancers are directly attributed to the two main oncogenic subtypes of HPV. So the incidence of um, in men, and this was in normal, healthy men, um, this study, HIM, Human Papillomavirus in Males study. I love the name. It's great. It makes it easy. So they, so they swabbed about 1,200 healthy patients that were not high risk. Um, they weren't actually patients. I think these were just volunteers on the street. How they convinced 1,200 men to undergo penile swabs is beyond me. But they did it. And they found that 65% normal people walking around on the street had HPV positivity on swabs. Often they had multiple serotypes, meaning not just um, the oncogenic types or the benign types. They didn't specify which subtypes they had in this particular study, um, but just to know that there's a lot of HPV in our world. The uh, NHANE studies have looked at, you know, uh, Participants in the NHANE studies had similar results. About 45% of people will have uh, active you know, HPV, and uh, the sy uh, systematic reviews that have been done, the range is anywhere as high as 75%. It's so high that the CDC actually came out with a statement, and I believe this was from around 2020. Um, HPV is so common that nearly all sexually active men and women get it or are exposed to the virus at some point in their lives. Um, inhane studies were done because um, spe specifically looking at rates of precancer lesions, rates of HPV positivity um, as the vaccines were rolling out. So the, the first vaccine was available in 2006. It was available for any woman under the age of 26. Um, so in 2006, I was not a woman, so I did not qualify for this vaccine. It was then extended to males in 2009, under the age of 26. Little fun fact here, I was over the age of 26 in 2009, so I was not eligible then either. However, more recently, it's been open to anyone under the age of 45. <clears throat> 
the NHANES studies looked at um, the covered strains of HPV in participants from before the vaccine era, so looking up to about 2004, what the rates of cervical cancer and cervical dysplasia and presence of HPV, and then looked again after the vaccines rolled out. So they started around 2008 and collected a cohort there. And what they found was there was an over 80% reduction in prevalence of HPV from the pre-vaccine era to the post-vaccine era. So the vaccines are effective in preventing people from picking up this virus. But how good are we at vaccinating? Well, you know, you can imagine. It is what it is. Um, in this particular map, anything that's yellow is low and anything that's, I guess it's pink is high and then everything else is kind of in the middle. Uh, here in Virginia, we're kind of in the middle. We're at about 50% vaccination rate. So not that great, but could, you know, certainly not terrible. This particular graph only looks at um, individuals under the age of 18. Um, so now that the vaccine has been extended to people who are uh, up to 45, you know, the numbers could be better. Um, but we'll, uh, you know, the, the real, the real uh, impact is vaccinating early. So I think that's why they wanted to really show the vaccination rates pre-age 18, because that's where we get the most impact from the vaccination. So even though vaccination rates are only about 50 to 75 percent across the country, we are seeing a decreased incidence of cervical cancer in our country. However, HPV doesn't only cause cervical cancer. It also causes anal cancer and oropharyngeal cancer. These rates are still increasing at a rate of about 2 to 3% per year. The good news is, is that they are rare diseases, so they don't happen that often. Um, this does suggest a delay in the efficacy of the vaccination. Most anal cancers and oropharyngeal cancers start to appear in the fifth, sixth de decade of life. And so we may just have not had enough time progress since the vaccines rolled out to see a meaningful difference. Hopefully in the next you know, 20 years, we'll start to see that the vaccines are making a difference there as well. <clears throat> so most of the time when we're thinking about HPV, we're thinking about cervical cancer. We have to remember that it causes other cancers as well. So for me as a colorectal surgeon, when I'm talking about HPV, I'm usually talking about anal cancer and anal cancer precursor lesions, which is called anal dysplasia, oropharyngeal cancer, and um, you know skin of the perineum. So vulvar, vaginal, penile, perianal skin can all be affected and can all have cancer that's directly attributable to HPV. <clears throat> well, what about synchronous disease? There is, the, there is a very high risk of anal cancer in the cervical and vulvar cancer population. I share a handful of patients with the gynecology oncologist here. When they have a vulvar or vaginal cancer, the skin is the same tissue that surrounds the anus. It makes sense that if it infects one zone, it doesn't know the boundary and it just, um, and it can just as easily infect the anal canal or the perianal skin. Um, as high as 40% of patients with um, cervical HPV not necessarily cancer, but presence of HPV in the cervix. 40% of those will have concurrent <clears throat> anal HPV. And the risk is highest in the high-risk patients. Those who are HIV positive or immunocompromised through organ transplantation or other things like that. The highest risk patients, um, we recommend routine screening. That's the same thing as a pap smear, a cytology swab done for both you know, the cervix in women and the anus in everyone. So again, HPV in the colorectal surgeon. What am I talking about here? <clears throat> we'll start with a little bit of anal anatomy. So the anus is the end of the GI tract, and it's similar in a lot of ways to the mouth, from the tissue uptake, the transition from lining mucosal columnar cells to non-keratinized squamous cells, which would be the anoderm, which is similar to the mucosa of the lips and cheeks. And then the perianal skin, you see the development of sweat glands, hair follicles, um, other epidermal appendages that help, that help us you know, determine where things are. 
just proximal to this dentate line, um, which you can kind of see cartoon illustrated here, um, is what's known as the anal transition zone. So there's also a cervical transformation zone. Um, and this is where the cell types gradually change from columnar cells to um, squamous cells that are non-keratinized. It's an area of very high turnover. Cells are replacing themselves every three to four days. So if you get a virus that has oncogenic potential and a very high rate of cellular transformation, it makes sense that that could lead to some DNA damage or incorporation into the host DNA and malignant transformation. <clears throat> so when we talk about how we get infected in the anus, the, the classical understanding is that anal sex results in exposure to the live virus through you know, breaks in the anal mucosa at the anal transition zone. And those breaks allow the virus to penetrate to the basilar cells, which is this kind of dark purple right up against the blue here on the histology. Um, that leads to a chronic infection, the DNA, the viral DNA can enter the nucleus of the cell and then the, the viral DNA is now immortalized. There's a, a more modern understanding, which is where we talk about the direct contact with virus-laden slough squamous cells. Those are the ones that can survive for seven days on a desktop. Um, <clears throat> it does not necessarily require a break in the anal mucosa. The, um, the virus itself can release these filament disassembly proteins, which then breaks down the cell junctions and the virus can penetrate into the basilar and parabasilar cells. That again leads to the chronic infection. An alternative, <clears throat> an alternative method has been described where um, virins bind, bind on the surface and then are retro-transported to the basilar layer through um, filipodia and, um, and leads to those basilar and parabasilar cells and chronic infection. <clears throat> and this has been proven in other viruses. So the thing to remember is that <clears throat> It doesn't require the direct contact, the sexual contact, <clears throat> or the wound. It can spread just from picking up the virus in the environment. Briefly about anal diseases. There was a lot of previous terminology. Bowen's disease, squamous cell carcinoma in situ, high and low-grade anal dysplasia, anal epithelial neoplasia, and these things all say cancer in some way without actually saying it. These are all the same thing. This is all anal dysplasia. This is all a precancerous lesion. But the terminology was all over the place, very confusing for providers, such that up to 25% of patients um, were radiated for a precancerous lesion. That data came from the SEER database. And that's complete over-treatment of a precancerous lesion. So in uh, 2001, some pathologists got together and decided that we were going to re rename all of this. That was the last project, the Lower Anogenital Squamous Terminology Project. And um, basically said that we're going to call everything low-grade or high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. So no intraepithelial neoplasia, no cancer in situ, no scary words that trick people into getting you know, radiation that they don't need. And we use an immunohistochemistry stain for um, P16, which is not the same thing as HPV 16 oncotype, right? This is a genetic um, stain looking for, at immunohistochemistry. We use that to differentiate high grade versus low grade, and then we base our treatments on that. <clears throat> so the natural history of an HPV infection <clears throat> taken from the gynecology literature because um, the colorectal literature still hasn't quite caught up. Um, a normal cervix acquires HPV through one of the transmission methods. Um, HPV is then detected. Does it clear and go back to a normal cervix after a 12-month infectious period? Um, do they become persistently HPV seropositive where the virus is then you know, fully acquired? Often, what we'll see is that there's, there can be progression from detection of HPV to detection of cancer precursor lesions, which would be the dysplasia. These can spontaneously regress. When we studied women with um, cervical lesions, um, often 12 months after the initial um, 
detection period, we would see no sign of dysplasia, meaning that the body was able to clear the virus and also clear the dysplasia. That's in a normal immunocompetent patient. The high-grade lesions may progress to cancer or they may spontaneously regress. So it's not as cut and dry as some other cancers where we have a precancerous lesion. We know if we don't do something, it'll turn into cancer. What this means is that for a long time, we weren't sure if we should be treating these or just observing these or what should we be doing to manage these precancerous lesions. So I like to think of it as kind of the four main ways that the virus can integrate itself or what's going to happen to the viral DNA after exposure. Sometimes the antigen complex will just lead to clearance and the patient will never have a dysplastic lesion or never have any problems. That could also be a latent infection and we really can't sort out who gets a latent infection and who completely clears the virus. Another possible option is that the DNA gets integrated into the host DNA, which is us, but it's in an intron. It's in a non-coding segment, so nothing ever really happens. They'll constantly be HPV seropositive. We'll constantly see HPV DNA, but it's not being replicated because it's in a non-replicating segment of our host DNA. Other options is that it integrates into coding regions. Well, that's kind of a problem. That means that we're basically carrying around HPV DNA with us and replicating it when we replicate these cells every three days. Or it enters in the nucleus and it can survive as an episome. It's a tight little coiled fragment of DNA. It can exist outside of the host DNA just sitting in the nucleus. But after many years of accumulating these genetic mutations, that can lead to the dysplasia, the dysplastic, and the precancerous lesions. So what's the prevalence of anal dysplasia? That's the real one of concern is high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. And in high-risk patients, high-grade dysplasia can cause a cancer and it can do so at a relatively frequent interval. When we look at HIV-positive patients, men who have sex with men, up to 97% will have high-grade dysplasia at some point in their life. And women, up to 30% will have it. Transplant recipients, those would be immunocompromised from immunosuppression. We see it as high as 20% for those who have undergone solid organ transplantation. The low-grade dysplasia, it's only ever really reported in these high-risk groups. There's probably a lot of people walking around with no high-risk features that have low-grade dysplasia. And we don't really know what to do with that because low-grade dysplasia does not necessarily progress into high-grade dysplasia. Treatment. Well, this slide is just to show you that there's a lot of treatment options. And all of them have recurrence. It's a virus. It's not cured very well with an operation. The main thing that we usually, that we do is we go in and we ablate. So we ablate the areas that look particularly bad, which removes any dysplastic cells. And then we let normal healthy tissue regrow and hopefully replace that area. But the recurrence rate is still quite high. When we look at the outcomes, I leave this slide particularly busy just to show that yes, there is a primary response rate for all of these treatments, but there is also a recurrence rate that's quite high for all of these treatments as well. And so all treatment options have high rates of recurrence and often require multiple sessions. So for a long time, we weren't really sure if we should even be doing anything because it just seems to recur. Should we just be keeping an eye on things, biopsying and making sure that there's no progression to cancer? What about in the non-high risk patients? This is where it gets especially tricky. It's really hard to find patients who are not high risk with dysplasia because they need some sort of symptoms or some sort of trigger to prompt them to be tested for the disease in the first place. One of the biggest studies, 10 years in a high referral center, and they, after 10 years, only found 400 patients that had evidence of high grade dysplasia in a non-high risk patient. And of those patients, 
oh, sorry, only 42 patients <laughs> were found that were non-high risk. Those are HIV negative and non-immunosuppressed. And 80% of those had high-grade dysplasia, which had a very high rate of recurrence. One patient in 10 years progressed to a squamous cell cancer, despite being on therapy. Um, my former partners at MD Anderson had a very similar experience, 42 patients, two of which progressed to cancer. So the rate of progression in a non-high-risk patient is much lower than in a high-risk patient. <clears throat> Again, treatment outcomes, just to show you, this often requires multiple treatments and um, multiple treatment options, multiple treatment courses, but the recurrence rates were very high across the board. So this year, uh, ANCHOR study was published. This is looking at high-risk patients only, um, but to try to answer the question of should we be doing anything since these lesions can spontaneously regress. So in this case, we had 25 institutions participating, um, almost 5,000 patients with um, 25 months follow-up. They all had high-grade dysplasia, they were all high risk, and they were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to a treatment arm of biopsy, uh, ablation, or topical therapies, uh, and observation. And in those arms, Nine cancers developed in the treatment arm, and 21 cancers developed in the observation arm, suggesting that some form of treatment reduces the risk of cancer by about 50%, which I think is a significant enough number to say that I, we can safely say we should be doing something for these people. We still don't know what's the best treatment option. Um, my treatment algorithm is loosely based on data, but mostly based on review of these types of papers and, um, and expert opinions, is that when you find any of these high-grade or low-grade lesions, that you do what's called a high-resolution anoscopy. Um, some centers have the equipment to do this in the office. Here we do it in the operating room, and that allows me to use a magnifying colposcope, um, special stains to look for areas of dysplasia, and then I can biopsy them and treat them directly at that, at, at that point in time. Some patients will elect to go on the topical therapy once the diagnosis is made, and I think that's reasonable as long as we're following them with anoscopies um, at regular intervals. But when we look at, you know, what's the real risk of this, right? One cancer here, two cancers there, nine cancers in the treatment arm. How many anal cancers do we see? in the United States. So how many of these lesions are going to turn into a cancer? We see less than 10,000 new anal cancers every year in the United States. And we say that, you know, at least 90% of those are attributable to HPV. It's probably more. Um, in the high risk, in the non-high risk population, it's about half. Okay, so less than 4,000 new cancers in a non-high risk population. And assuming that there's about 350 million Americans, 4,000 new cancers, it's less than 0.001% of patients got an HPV-related cancer that were not high risk. So the risk is quite low, which is good because everybody probably has HPV, and I just spent you know however many slides telling you how we've all been exposed and we're all going to get this. But good to know that probably not any of us will get it, okay? And if we talk a little bit about anal cancer, we should probably talk a little bit about colon cancer, right? Um, the background of colon cancer is, you know, it is a very high leading cause of death in the United States and in the state of Virginia. Um, cancer was the number two leading cause of death in 2020, and that's been consistent with prior years. And colorectal cancer is usually about the third most prevalent and the third most deadly cancer of all the cancers. So a significant proportion of people will be will develop a colon or a rectal cancer in their lifetime. The statistics would say that it's about 1 in 20, you know, without any high-risk features, will go on to develop a cancer. And I'm not sure how many people are on the web, but there's probably at least 20 of us here, right? So much higher chance that one of us would get a colon cancer than an anal cancer. Well, how does HPV relate to colon cancers? The colon is not really exposed 
to HPV in the same way that the anus and the perianal skin, the vulvar skin, the penile skin would be. Well, this, you know, is the um, proposed mechanism of traditional um, um, uh, oncogenic transformation of colon cancer. We have normal mucosa that gets some various genes methylated, becomes hyperproliferative, and causes an early adenoma. Early adenomas, if not removed with colon, colon screening me methods such as colonoscopy, will then progress over the next seven to ten years and result in an adenocarcinoma. One of the late changes that occurs in this process is loss of a p53 mutation. And if we remember earlier, the E6 protein binds to and inhibits p53. So if HPV were exposed into the colon tract, it makes sense that it would lead to maybe an increase in colon cancer formation in patients. And that's what some studies have, oh, vanished. That's what some studies have shown. Um, a large meta-analysis out, um, out of the Netherlands demonstrated <clears throat> when they looked at 40 studies of a comparison of colorectal cancer tissue to control tissue biopsied alongside the tumor somewhere in the, in the GI tract. Um, and they used PCR, most of these used PCR-based studies to, to look for presence of HPV in the cancer versus presence of HPV in the normal tissue. And in this study, they had 2,600 adenocarcinomas and found that the range of HPV prevalence in the carcinoma was as high as 80%, also as low as zero, but that's a meta-analysis, so you get what you get. Overall, the pooled data suggested that up to 15% of colon cancers have HPV DNA in them. <clears throat> and when they looked at location, proximal colon, which is the furthest away from the outside world, versus distal colon versus rectum, which is very close to the anus, there's a non-significant trend towards an increased risk of HPV-related distal colon and rectal tumors as opposed to proximal colon tumors. This suggests that there could be a retrograde transmission up the GI tract from the anal canal to the lower GI tract um, leading to HPV in these colon and, uh, colon and rectal cancers. Um, a more specific study was done out of Russia, and in this case, it was a meta-analysis of 19 studies where they had both tumor and control tissue. So every study had tumor tissue plus control tissue, and they ran PCR for HPV DNA, and about 2,000 adenocarcinomas, and again, 15% of the cancers had HPV DNA in them, as opposed to 3% of the control tissue. So that is a, st that is a significant finding. So it does seem to affect the rate of colon cancer as well, even though it is much, uh, much smaller of a, of a correlation than for anal cancer, cervical cancers, things like that. So, which leads me to the summary. HPV, this is very a complex disease, right? We know a lot more than we used to know about the human papillomavirus, but the transmission, it's, it's very simple, um, it, but anyone can get it. Right? The transmission can happen from using a public restroom, from using a telephone that one of your partners uses. We all slough anal squamous cells, not anal squamous cells, excuse me. Well, that too. We all slough squamous cells, and we leave them everywhere, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, uh, and so anyone can pick it up, and it's very transmissible. It survives for up to seven days. Um, there's multiple mechanisms that can lead to chronic infection, but the main thing is, is that most of us that are not high risk will clear the infection or at least prevent it from becoming a bigger problem, such as a high-grade dysplasia. Hopefully, use of simplified terminology will help keep things simple for me and, uh, and for what I do. Um, and the management is fairly complicated, topical versus operative treatment. The main thing is that the outcomes don't really seem to it seems that once the dysplasia is present, we have to keep a really close eye on it. And that does show that treatment does prevent progression to anal cancer. Um, there is a modest association with colon and rectal cancer, which is one of the biggest um, cancer problems that face our country. <clears throat> 
But it seems that vaccination is preventing disease, even though we're not particularly good at the vaccination rates. But I know that's not, it's not always our faults. Um, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I do believe this. I do believe that, um, that more, you know, more widespread vaccination rates will lower the rates of this disease which is for me is particularly important because once we finally get to that final stage of an anal cancer, the disease is incredibly debilitating for people. Um, they're difficult to treat. The recurrence rates are quite high. It requires multimodal therapies, often with chemotherapy, radiation therapy, often major surgery, permanent colostomy. So it is a very debilitating disease once it does set in. But the good news is, is that most average risk patients will not get it. This is my only real experience in pediatrics. Oh. Any questions? I think I went through that kind of quickly. <laughs> yes? Um, does anyone out there that you've heard of as an adjunct to uh, those who have anal cancer or colon cancer offer it all as a hypothesis or have they even tested this hypothesis of giving the vaccine just to see if it can help kickstart the immune system something like that um not that i know of so if i'm can the web uh, people hear the questions pretty well okay so uh, not that i know of once the cancer is in place usually we just go down the regular treatment algorithm for the cancer for cancer um, a good question would be once someone has dysplasia and we know that they have an oncogenic type of HPV. Is it worth vaccinating then? I think the answer is yes, because Gardasil covers nine oncogenic types, right? Well, seven oncogenic types and the two warp types, right? But we often don't know which type of HPV caused their cancer. It's usually HPV 16. That's the, that's the smoking gun most of the time. Um, but we don't often know. And so if there's seven others that we could potentially protect against, I think it makes sense to do it. Um, some people have called for uh, vaccination in healthcare workers because we are more likely to be exposed, especially gynecologists doing pap smears, um, colposcopy, especially if they're treating the cervix and burning something off and aerosolizing the virus. For what I do, I do a very similar thing, it's just on a different organ, right? We treat it, we burn it, we, there's probably aerosolized viral particles there. There's no good data to support that we should be vaccinated, but personally, I think we should. <laughs> like everyone. <laughs> like everyone. Um, yes? Uh, do you think that we should change our screening for um, like all transplant recipients and HIV patients to have like anal? cancer swabs or so we do here so here at the infectious disease department um, does routine screening um, of anal cytology of everyone that they treat and they do it annually and if they pick up something or if the cells are indeterminate or if they pick up an HPV uh, then they'll often send it to me for a treatment procedure where we can go and look biopsy remove things and find out if they have high-grade dysplasia or not, because that is the highest risk group of patients. We want to catch them as much as we can. So our, our infectious disease group here does routinely screen high-risk patients. We don't routinely screen organ transplant patients, as far as I know. We're not a transplant center, but I don't know that other transplant centers are routinely screening before transplant you know, they get colonoscopies before transplant. They get workup for, um, you know, latent infections, TB, stuff like that before transplant. Um, but I don't know if they're getting routine screening for HPV before transplant. I guess that begs the question, should they all be getting HPV vaccine before transplant? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Everyone should get it. Um, I have one more question. Yes. Um, so have you seen an increased rate in, I mean, this probably study probably hasn't been done, so it would have to be anecdotal likely, 
have you had an increased rate of people who have been on immunosuppressant therapies for things like IBD seem to have an increased risk, or are you just attributing their increased risk to the fact that they're chronically inflamed to begin with? Yeah, the IBD patient population is, is challenging um, because they are treated with usually anti-tumor necrosis factor agents. Um, they, don't, they don't tend to be particularly immunosuppressed from these agents, um, but they are at some higher risk just from having the inflammatory bowel disease, you know, about 20 to 30 percent, or sorry, 20 to 30 times the average risk just from having the IBD. So whether that's because they can't clear an HPV infection or if it's just from the nature of the disease itself is not, not overly clear, but it certainly could be. so much for that yeah. wonderful talk. Again, not a lot of pediatric data in here, but hopefully it was useful. <laughs> yeah. uh, it was very useful in that one of our, one of our uh, quality measures is try to improve our vaccination rate of HPV. So um, I think it just adds fuel to that fire to try to try to start to work. The, you guys are on the front line for this. So. <laughs> Literally on the back line. On the back line. <laughs> well, I'm on the back line. <laughs>